Hi, my name is Jubin Jos. I'm a member of Emma organization and the lead contributor to Akila DB open source project. Today I'm going to talk about neural information retrieval with Akila DB. So you'll be exploring what uh, neural information retrieval at the first place and we will discuss how Akila DB can be used for that. As you can see, you can access these slides that I'm using now from this URL. So here's the session plan. Almost half of the time I will be giving you a brief introduction to machine learning. I'm not going into the details of the mathematics background or anything like that. Just intuition I will be giving to you uh, about the neural networks and deep learning. And after that, uh, we will move on to Aquila DB and we will discuss different concepts and possibly I can give you uh, three demos on that. Okay, so here is quick introduction to machine learning. Artificial intelligence or AI, which is a broad area that focuses on developing programs that can sense, reason, act and adapt to the environment they are in. And machine learning is a very specific area where we develop algorithms that can improve their performance based on the data that we are exposing them to over time. And deep learning, uh, which is a very specific area within machine learning. There's a specialized algorithm that's multi-layered neural networks. By deepening these neural networks and training them on a very large amount of data. So here are some other points. AI or AGI is still an unsolved problem. And deep learning is one of the many techniques in practice and is popular today because of the GPU optimizations and the computer hardware support that provides for deep learning. Deep learning models are black box algorithms. By black box what we mean is we do not understand what's happening within that algorithm but somehow it manages to produce useful results to us. So these algorithms pushed and still pushing the capabilities of softwares in the industry. And of course computers are dumb. We can consider this deep learning just like any other algorithms that performs really better now. Maybe we will come up with some other algorithms in the future that may outperform these deep learning methods. But currently, these are the hope that we have. We as human have been in a search for a universal equation that can define and explain how this universe works and uh, maybe we can use that equation to predict what's going to happen in the next moment even though we were not able to achieve that yet we managed to approximate to the underlying equation that we hope one is there at least in some cases a neural network is one such algorithm with that we can approximate these underlying functions in some real world problems that we see so What's deep learning? Deep learning uses very deep neural networks trained on very large amount of data and we also need high-end machines that is required for low latency predictions with these pre-trained models. Deep learning neural networks are very deep to produce these awesome results that we see today. You can explore this link to see how deep these neural networks are for computer vision. So before going into more details of deep neural networks, let's pause here and see what is a vector and how it is important in computation of deep neural networks. So a vector is an ordered set of numbers. It is just a set of numbers, but the order matters. With a vector, you can represent any kind of data. You can represent a position in space with vector or you can describe a house with the help of vector. For example, think of uh, you are representing multiple houses in a uh, CSV file. And for each column, you are specifying different features like the number of rooms, number of floors, uh, and the square feet of that house, uh, the longitude and latitude of the house location, the price of the house, etc. You can choose any feature you wanted and you just represent them with some numbers. 
That's how you vectorize a house. You can vectorize your favorite movies the same way. Maybe the genre of movie, the actors who have played in that, your ratings for that movie, etc. You can vectorize a sentence into vectors through one hot encoding or sentence embeddings. Yeah, we will look into that later. You can convert an image, audio or video into vectors. Yeah, actually they are represented as uh, vectors in the computer anyway. So the idea is you can represent almost any kind of data as vectors in computers. Vectors can be multidimensional. And also, as I have said earlier, computers are good at processing uh, or transforming. That's the right word. Vectors with GPU. Linear algebra is central to almost all areas in mathematics and it operates on vectors. So the idea is with linear algebra, we can transform these vectors within computer GPU. So here is the high level idea of what a linear transformation means. On the left side, you can see you have a vector. And after that, you see a matrix. That's a transformation matrix. That can be anything. And that can be defined by anyone. Maybe a programmer can handwrite these uh, transformation matrices. Or a program itself can learn these transformation matrix. So the idea is this matrix transforms the vector input on the left side to the vector output on the right side. And how this transformation happens? We just take a dot product between this input vector and transformation matrix to produce output vector. So if we consider the input vector as x and the transformation matrix as m, we say that x dot m gives y. That's it. So here you can see some programmer written transformation matrix for computer graphics. What it does is it takes a point in 2D space, which is x1, x2, and transforms it to another point y1 by 2. So if we look closely, we can actually see something else in this. If we rewrite the previous equation, we get equation of a line. What's the equation of a line? y is equal to mx plus b. I said it a line but it actually a hyperplane. A hyperplane in 2D space is a line. A hyperplane in a 3D space is a plane. As the dimensionality increases, we can generalize these things as a hyperplane in multi dimensions. As we have seen, y is equal to mx plus b, where y is the output vector, m is the transformation matrix, and x is the input vector. And in the previous cases, the constant b is taking a value of 0, which means when b is 0, we can transform a line or a hyperplane about the origin. And if we start to change the value of b as well, we can move a transformed hyperplane around the Cartesian. Here you can see what I meant by that. If we set the value of b to 0 and we try to change only the transformation matrix, that is m. By doing that, the hyperplane or line is only moving about the origin. And when we change the value of b as well along with m, we can just not only transform the hyperplane, but also move that hyperplane around the origin. So what's the takeaway from the previous examples? That's how to fit a line to data. We have seen that this is the equation of line and this is the output vector that we are expecting. This is the input vector that we are giving in and this is the transformation matrix and this is the bias term or the constant term that we are adding by adjusting this bias and transformation matrix we can actually transform x into any value that we prefer so x can be any length vector or dimension and y equals mx plus b creates a hyperplane in that dimension here is an example where we 
try to fit a line with some data that we have by adjusting M and B only. Yeah, we can call this linear regression. A neural network is doing a series of linear transformations. As we can see here, we are giving in an input X and we take a dot product of that with some weight matrix. I would like to call it a transformation matrix and we get a hidden layer that's output of that transformation. We use the same hidden layer as the input vector. We use another weight that's weight output or I would like to call it transformation matrix 2. We take a dot product of them and we get another output which is a transformation of hidden layer. So here is the same idea. We have an input vector. We take a dot product with the weight matrix for the first layer or we call it a transformation matrix for the first layer and we get the first layer uh, result and to move it around the space we are adding the constant term b or bias we will look into this non-linearity in the next slides but just currently ignore it then this hidden layer is dot producted with another weight matrix or transformed into the final output layer and of course a bias is added to that and we apply non-linearity so as I have said a neural network is applying a series of transformations to the input till the output so here are the points a neural network applies a series of linear transformations to a hyperplane in that way it is able to do linear fit or separation of data through these transformations and here is the second thing that we have omitted earlier that's an activation function or we call it non-linearity this non-linearity is added in between each transformation that's the special thing that we do at each layer of the neural network in the previous case we were only able to fit a line through the data but adding a non-linearity we were able to convert the line or hyperplane into a curve on the left side you can see a neural network without an activation function so it's fitting only a line to the data and on the right side what you are seeing is a neural network with activation function which fits a curve to the data and that's more perfect than fitting a line what we learned so far is a neural network is applying a series of transformations to an input vector till the output layer and at each layer it is introducing a non-linearity to fit a curve to the data that we have so when we do training we need to adjust both the transformation matrix and the bias to actually move around this hyperplane throughout the space to fit the data that we have that's where we need back propagation let's be practical i'm not going to explain back propagation and stuff over here if you are a beginner you can use keras or tensorflow or pytorch library for machine learning they have automatic differentiation and they will of course do back propagation for you tensorflow recently released tensorflow 2.0 version which supports keras api so if you are an absolute beginner or if you are familiar with Keras API, you can of course use TensorFlow 2.0. Use Jupyter Notebooks for prototyping your idea. And in many cases, you can use pre-trained models from TensorFlow Hub or any other model repositories to perform transfer learning whenever it's possible. Because during prototyping, we cannot expect to have a lot of data the data should be limited on our hand so to get started immediately we should be performing transfer learning for that most importantly understand the problem and think with what minimum resources it can be solved by minimum resources what i mean is 
minimum computational resources and also minimum data requirements for that. Now let's move on to vector similarity. I'm going to only discuss cosine similarity over here but the idea is almost same for every kind of sim vector similarities out there. By explaining only one of them what I hope is you will get an understanding of both vector similarities and how that can be used in different scenarios as we move forward with through these slides. To find cosine similarity between two vectors what you can do is take a dot product of those two vectors and divide that value with the absolute values of those vectors or the magnitude of those vectors. By doing this you will get a number between 0 and 1 which represents how similar those two vectors are. If the number is very close to 0 which means the vectors are perpendicular and are very dissimilar and if the numbers are very close to 1 that means the vectors are parallel and are very similar. So let's be practical here. In practical situations you might use cosine similarity in a lot of places. In that case we need to be very tricky and computationally efficient. One such example is to find the most similar vectors from a huge data dump given an input vector. To do that we need to compare each vector in the dump with the input vector efficiently. So there are two things that we can do. One thing is get rid of the denominator term uh, because division operations are costly. So if we know that the elements of the vectors are drawn from a fixed range we can just get rid of the denominator value. Uh, after you search uh, for the vectors just sort the index based on the result. The result should be the distance between vectors and choose the first n vectors from the sorted index. So being that said let's continue with the neural network and let's observe what a neural network is doing in a perspective of vector similarity. So at each layer the network checks how the input match to the learned representations or weights we can call it and filters it to keep the relevant pattern from the input to produce next hidden layer. At each layer this filtering process continues as we move forward high level but only the essential features of the original inputs are being preserved. So if we cut a pre-trained neural network into two at any layer and examine it we get a generalized representation of any input to the network. This is very important because a neural network is doing very similar thing as a dimensionality reduction. So at each layer we can expect only the interesting features in an input are kept alive and all the noises are removed and this refinement improves as we move forward through the network. The network removed unwanted features from the input and gives a generalized representation of it. So this is where the importance of transfer learning appears. Because we can obtain a generalized representation from any pre-trained neural network just by tearing it apart, we can do incredible things with it. Are you short on training data? Just use pre-trained model and do transfer learning. Do you want to access an unstructured data based on its general properties? Just use pre-trained model and index it in a vector database along with the unstructured data. The upcoming slides are only interested on the second thing that we have mentioned just now. That's why we are going to use AquilaDB. We will pass some inputs to a pre-trained neural network. 
we extract a generalized representation in the form of vectors from that and we will index those in a vector database for later retrieval by doing similarity search. Transfer learning is one of the default thing you should do today when you develop your applications or at least during prototyping because you can get started with your development if you are short on data that's the advantage that you get if you are working in NLP domain you can use pre-trained language models to perform transfer learning you can either use embeddings those are actually the pre-trained model that's being cut at the lowest layers some examples are word to vec glove fast text star space etc and there are encodings which can be considered as some pre-trained model that's being cut uh, into two at the highest layer some examples are bird gpt excelnet roberta etc it's also applicable for other data types like images audio graphs etc for images you can use pre-trained models from tensorflow hub uh, like mobile net and for audio you can find m different models in terms of flow hub for graphs i would recommend you you to use pytorch big graph from facebook that's actually promising one also there are different repositories available to get these pre-trained models from one is tensorflow there is another one uh, which is hugging face transformers library there is PyTorch hub for PyTorch enthusiasts and of course in GitHub also you can find pre-trained models for different use cases. So here are the high level steps that you can do for transfer learning. First of all load a tailless pre-trained model by tailless what I mean is the final layer is removed from the pre-trained model that's tailless <laughs> I guess and attach a fake tail of your interest you can add um, more layers at the end of the pre-trained model you have obtained then you can freeze the body because that's already trained and train only the attached tail on some part of your data in that way you can first optimize the untrained part of the uh, model you have now once you have uh, done enough iterations you can unfreeze the body and fully train the new model on the other part of your data and one more thing uh, it doesn't matter the difference in data sets that the pre-trained model is trained on when you obtain it for some other kind of data that you have that's not a big deal so fast AI courses does explains transfer learning techniques with good examples if you are interested you can check it out so the first session of our presentation is over in the next session we will be exploring what information retrieval means and how modern information retrieval can be done with the help of neural networks and vector databases like Aquila DB. Information retrieval is everywhere in the industry. It ranges from your PC's file search, SQL, NoSQL to knowledge graphs. The information retrieved can be exact or approximate. In case of SQL, NoSQL, knowledge graph etc. We can say that the information retrieval are exact because we require some query to be satisfied but there is a big field out there where approximate information retrieval is a main player and we are going to focus on that okay so why approximate information retrieval is important here are some use case examples in the modern era you can perform image or video search by providing either some text information or the image or video itself you can perform document search with some search query 
or you can use information retrieval systems to build chatbots or voice bots you can perform song search similar song searches on the data you have recommend similar videos photos or anything and also you can perform classification which can be sentiment analysis image classification or uh, the type of error that happened based on the server log data that you have maybe you can do live monitoring with that you can also perform similarity search on graph data as well so these are some examples that i can share with you right now so what's wrong with traditional information retrieval traditionally we need to manually feature engineer the data and write custom logic for each requirement because data can be different by its type or the features it have so because we don't have a generalized methodology for information retrieval we should manually feature engineer the data and write custom logic for the exact requirement we have also the data storage and retrieval mechanism varies for different use cases and this results in zero reusability of the existing system that you have already built different databases have different api interfaces because the database deal with text may be different from the database that deal with image or audio or maybe graphs etc so this introduces uh, unwanted complexities into the scene retrieval is not efficient as well it is slow there is no measure to estimate the latency added by the ir system to the entire application interoperability with modern machine learning pipeline is poor for the traditional information retrieval systems and is a headache to the adapter writers as well so what's available for modern neural information retrieval systems just train a deep neural network model over the data you have it will learn to encode your data actually referring to the dimensionality reduction feature of a deep neural network then just dissect it by its head or tail it's up to you and feed your data to it and collect what's on the other side index all those vectors you have received at the other end of the neural network and index it in a vector database like aquila db along with json metadata to give it more meaning and when you want to perform information retrieval do the same step 3 step 3 means you just feed the data you have through the neural network and perform kernel search on the vector database with the new vector you have it's that simple let me introduce aquila db which is the muscle memory for your machine learning applications aquila db is being developed under emma brand uh, emma is a force ml interest group focused on uh, malayalam language data set generation and chatbots but eventually we found that uh, some basic and common problems uh, in ml applications should be solved so we decided to solve some of them for our own projects and it turned out to be very useful to everyone else in that sense ma is currently growing out of the boundaries we have set already and it is trying to find a perfect place uh, to serve the mankind so what's aquila db aquila db is a vector and document database It can be said as a muscle memory for your machine learning applications it's like redis for machine learning if you are familiar with web application development it performs super fast kernel search over a large vector data so why you need this aquila db it's already said you can rely on end to end machine learning models for information retrieval you need to keep document metadata along with vectors to add more meaning so aquila db is both a vector database and a document database like mongodb and you can perform 
k nearest neighbor search on your vectors and you receive the vectors and the metadata that's stored along with that vector it's easy to set up and start using it in minutes that's the biggest advantage of AcularDB and we are always focused on that it should be easier to use for everyone it's language agnostic you don't need to use uh, Python, JavaScript, Java or anything. There is no restrictions because it's communicating through gRPC protocol. So the API is same for everyone. Anyone can write their own client libraries in their own languages. We currently have a Python library already built and ready to go. And we are currently working on Node.js library. So it's language agno agnostic. Ocularity is solved. Actually, it's a bit exaggerated. A uh, lot of the problems uh, that's with traditional information retrieval. So the question is how to use AcularDB. How can I use AcularDB in my projects? That's very simple. You just need Docker. Actually, Docker is everywhere. We are assuming that uh, in everyone's system they have docker installed already well in that case you don't need any prerequisites so just pull the AcularDB image from docker hub and run it that's all now that you have already running AcularDB in your PC you just need to connect to it we currently have a Python library for Python developers so you just install that Python library with pip install AcularDB and just write down six lines of code to interface with the API here is the release roadmap for AcularDB if you are interested to check it out you can go to github slash a-mma slash AcularDB you can try it out and contribute to it we actually need more contributors because we are struggling uh, with the limited resources that we have now okay that's all we have to talk about Aquila DB. in the next three videos we will be showing you three different use cases where you can use AcularDB and get